So all of you, right now, are being robbed. You don't realize it. I'll say that again in case you lost the nuance. Every one of you is being robbed right now. Not just you, but everyone you know. Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your coworkers, everyone you know, including me. You see, all of us have our data, data about us, being bought and sold every day to the tune of tens and hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Money that we don't see. Why? It's an interesting question, isn't it? If it's your data. You see, we are all serfs in a digital feudal system that sprang up under our very noses. We didn't even realize it was there. We were so busy just pumping our data into everything that was out there, every app. We had to play Farmville. We had to know which Kardashian we were, right? I think I'm Chloe. I'm not really sure. I have to work on that, okay? You keep pumping your information out. Now, you may say, but Michael, you know, there's a lot of conversation around this right now, and there is, and that's good. You see, but it's the wrong conversation, and here's why. The conversation that you're hearing in the news today is about privacy. And while important, the conversation we need to have is about property. So let's think about that for a second. Who owns your data? That's the fundamental question I want you to consider right now. Who owns your information? Is it you? Is it the system that it's placed in? It's an interesting question. So let's put aside the privacy hat for a second and talk about property for a moment. And in order to consider property and really understand ownership, we actually have to understand human rights. And now it may seem like a stretch, but it's actually critically important. So where do human rights come from? You have a sense that you have them. They're probably hard to articulate. Very broadly, we can say human rights are those rights that we have intrinsically and inherent because we are born human. Now, it tends to vary a little bit according to where you live, by the way, as you know, you know that right? And that's, by the way, part of the problem. Because we have this sense that human rights are given to us, that they are bestowed upon us by some other entity, God or government. So the story, at least in the modern age, may surprise you. It actually begins with Eleanor Roosevelt. You see, in 1948, fresh off of the atrocities of World War II, Eleanor Roosevelt worked with the then-fledgling UN to charter the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a list of 30 human rights that were intrinsically and inherently yours as human beings. All of us, regardless of race or color or creed or age or nationality or ethnicity, any qualifier, you had these basic human rights. And there were 30. Why 30? It's a good question. What were they? You have the right to life and liberty. You have freedom from being tortured and persecution. You have the right to be educated and to work. You have the right to freedom of expression. These are all basic things, things that we kind of take for granted. But did human rights begin with Eleanor Roosevelt? Highly unlikely. So let's look back in history. This is the Cyrus Scroll. Cyrus the Great, 539 BC. Some look at this and think this is the beginning of human rights, the first time we identified and codified human rights. Or you can go back further. Code of Hammurabi, 1754 B.C. We can go further. Magna Carta, 1215. U.S. Constitution, 1791. Each of them building on the last. Each of them expressing what they believed human rights should be at that moment. Now here's an interesting thought I want you to all consider. Every law, when it's created, is reflective of the time and environment in which it's created. Now, that seems very simple, but think about it, right? We are trying to solve for a very specific problem at that point in time and a problem that exists that we can solve using the technologies of our time. Now, sometimes that gets us in trouble because it's really tough for lawmakers to foresee what the future will look like, particularly if the future is far out. Sometimes you get in trouble. Let me give you an example. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, that one tends to be a little bit problematic right now. And that's not unique. As it turns out, all of them are a challenge. So we need to think about that. There's one other thing I want you to consider as well when we talk about human rights and law in general, is that in every one of the examples I gave you before, every one of these laws, every one of these rights came to us 
from one place. It was one person or one organization. It was a king. It was, right, the framers of the Constitution. It was a group. It's a small group, central group, which then said to us, here are your rights. Okay, makes sense. You see, so centralization has been a common theme in the way that we think about problems. Every one of you, if you have a job, you have a boss. Your boss has a boss. We're used to hierarchical structures. It's the way human beings have organized in modern history for many, many, many years. Why? It was the simplest way to get things done. We live in a representative democracy. We have a whole lot of people who elect one person to represent us to then go have conversations on our behalf. That's centralization. It's also an interesting jumping off point for the way that we can solve problems in the 21st century. And that is decentralization. Now, it's not just the opposite, it's a completely different thing. Because decentralization allows us to flatten structures. It allows us to look at problems and solutions very, very differently. Instead of having a representative that we rely on to tell us something, we can have the conversations ourselves. Each of us connected to each other in real time. So let's talk a little bit about how that happened. Now, we weren't always centralized. So go way back, prehistory, we're hunter-gatherers, we're wandering around as individuals or small family groups trying to find resources. We're hunting, we're gathering. If we come in contact with another group, chances are there's conflict. Why? Because we're all looking at the same resources. We are decentralized, we are disorderly. There's no rhyme or reason to what we do. And what happens is gradually, we start to realize that if we cooperate, you know what, we've got a better shot at this. We can use the resources more wisely. So now we have a situation where you've got slightly larger groups and we begin to see civilization start to flourish. We still have conflict, of course. If anything, we exacerbate that because what happens is some of those groups get a little bit bigger than those other groups. And if you're the big guy, what do you do? You take advantage of the little guy. And so when we look into history, we start to see centralization and enforced order. The Roman Empire is a good example of this. What did they do? They went off and said, all right, well, there's these other lands that we're going to conquer, and they're going to go ahead and be beholden to Roman rule. That is a centralized structure. So how is the 21st century different? It's completely different, and I'll tell you why. How many of you have heard of a technology called blockchain? Like three of you. Okay, here we go. That's a little bit challenging. We'll work on that. How many of you heard of Bitcoin? Oh, you all heard of Bitcoin. Okay, now that's interesting. Blockchain is what makes Bitcoin work. It is the underlying technology that allows for decentralization. Bitcoin is just a currency, and we're going to get to that in the middle. One of the things to think about when we think about decentralization is, is it possible for all of us to be connected to all of us in a completely decentralized and self-ordering manner? What would that look like? What would it look like if we didn't need intermediaries anymore? What would it look like if we didn't need someone to bestow on us those human rights? So let's look at some examples. Most scholars agree and believe that the first human writing was about capturing transactions. I gave you this, and you gave me that, and we agreed. It makes sense. Why? Well, because we needed to keep a record, and we needed to trust that record. We needed a trusted intermediary. So we invented first ledgers. And what ended up happening was is we found a way that we can transact with each other. It was a way that we could kind of keep both sides honest, to an extent. I'll make a simple statement. In order to transact with you, I must trust you. I'll say that again. In order to transact with you, I must trust you. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I've read a whole lot of contracts. And if you've never read a contract, basically they, they follow the following format, right? Uh, I'm going to do this, and you're going to do this, and we're going to exchange this, and here's a bunch of really bad stuff that's going to happen if you try to screw me which, by the way, I completely expect. Okay? Does that sound like a contract to you? It's exactly right. So we said, okay, well, we're going to do these things, and that's cool, but they have no teeth. What do we do? Well, we're going to invent this trusted intermediary, and we're going to call them courts. And the courts now have the authority to go ahead and tell us what's right. So now we don't trust each other, but we trust that the court is going to go ahead and work that out. How's that working for you, by the way? Right. Bit of a challenge. So we had this centralized service. So think about all the different intermediaries in your life. Think about the courts for law, banks, the DMV. There are dozens and dozens of intermediaries in life that you don't even think about. Credit reporting agencies. 
etc. Let's use another example. Let's talk about Uber for a second. First, we had taxis. And taxis were completely distributed. You can go to any city in the world. You can go to Paris. You can go to New York. You can go to Chicago. You can go to LA. You can hail a taxi. Those taxis are completely separated from each other. They have no relationship with each other. They are completely decentralized. And then Uber comes along and says, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to centralize that service. So no matter where you are in the world, you can pick up our app and you can go ahead and call a cab. So we centralized. We created a trusted intermediary for ride sharing. What if, however, we were to flatten that out? If we were to squash it down? What if everyone in the world who was looking for a ride could connect to everyone in the world who was willing to provide a ride? What if they were able to transact automatically through something we call smart contracts? What would that look like? We would out Uber Uber, right? We would disintermediate the centralized structure of Uber. So if we can do that for taxis, what else can we do it for? It's an interesting question. What else can we squash? Well, let's begin with something near and dear to most of our hearts, money. OK? So the first instantiations of blockchain and decentralization are actually in currency. So what is currency? Well, let's take a look. I got two pieces of paper here, US dollars. One is worth $1. One is worth $50. Why? Can anybody answer? Because you said so? Because the government said so? Right. These are the exact same pieces of paper. This one has a slightly different set of squiggly lines than this one does. Right? But this one is worth 50 times what this one is worth. These are called fiat currencies. Fiat currencies have no real use in and of themselves. They are worth what they say they're worth for two reasons. One is the government says so. Or two is we agree that this one's worth 50 and this one's worth a single. See, it's sort of a group delusion. We all agree that these currencies are of value. So it starts to think and percolate, right? Well, if that's true, if we can all agree on a currency and a value, is there another way to look at this? Do we need an intermediary? And this is an experiment in that. So the first hypothesis around blockchain and centralization is this concept of cryptocurrencies. Now, you're going to see an explosion in here around 2017. What this is showing is ICOs. These are cryptocurrencies that are beginning to pop up on the, on the market. And you're going to see an explosion right about now. Each of these are completely decentralized cryptocurrencies where organizations and groups got together and said, we agree that this thing has a value and we will transact directly with each other using that value. There are thousands and thousands of cryptocurrencies of every different stripe. You can't imagine. There's Banana Coin, Whopper Coin. Many of them are useless, OK? But what happens is the beginning of any new revolution, you see this. You see divergence. And what will happen over time is these thousands will become hundreds, and the hundreds will become dozens. And then over time, we will find select cryptocurrencies, decentralized cryptocurrencies, that reach the sanctity and fidelity of fiat currency. That is, they are as widely held and as recognized in value as the dollars in our pocket. So let's think about this. If we take blockchain and we take decentralization and we apply it to economics, we can decentralize currency. If we take that same mindset, that same approach, if we take blockchain and decentralization and apply it to the law and legal structures, we can decentralize rights. See, rights don't have to be bestowed upon you. They can be instantiated by us, in agreement by us. And here's where we begin. I told you that you had 30 human rights, according to Eleanor Roosevelt. Thank you, Eleanor. Your 31st human right, the first digital human right, the first right instantiated in the 21st century, will be one that we create ourselves. Every human being owns their data, and that data is your property. I'll say that again. Your data is your property. You own it. It has value. And if we all agree on that, we can instantiate that. So how does that look? What does that do? The first 30 human rights were created over a course of 3,000 years. It happened slowly. It happened in a centralized way. They were handed to us. They were bestowed upon us by God and government. But we're at an inflection point now. 
we can change that initiative. We can change that incentive. We can move things forward much, much faster. In fact, in the next 100 years, we could have another 30 rights if we create them ourselves. And they can come from anywhere. It's not me telling you what your rights are. It's you instantiating the rights. And if we have enough consensus, if enough people believe that this thing is a right, it's a right. If enough people believe a dollar is a dollar, it's a dollar. So what does that look like? What happens if you own your data? What happens to the robbery we talked about earlier? Because if your data has value, shouldn't you receive something for that? Shouldn't that value be yours? What happens when the quantified self becomes the monetized self? What's the socioeconomic impact of all of this money flowing back to the people who own and create it? What if you had the ability to control and authorize who had access, for what purpose, under what terms? What if you had Uber for money, right? Think about it that way. So if we decentralize rights, how can we accelerate that? We can take cryptocurrencies, We've applied decentralization and applied it to economics. We have currency. If we apply the same thing to law, we can have crypto built rights. You own your data. Your data is your property. Your property has value and you are entitled to that value. This will be the next human right that we recognize. The 31st human right. The first right for the digital age. My name is Michael De Palma, and on behalf of humanity, thank you.